this recording now. Okay, so can everyone see and hear me just fine? Thumbs up? Cool, great. So I'm Huria Jazari. I'm a professor here at the Levy School of Business. I'm in the management department. And I wanted to share a little bit about one of the classes that I teach here, which is on leadership. And I want to talk about how you all can become an exemplary leader uh, today, as in after this uh, session. So um, I wanted to first introduce um, a couple of folks who are joining me here today. So I'm really delighted to be joined by one of my former students from winter quarter, uh, Malkai Finn. So Malkai is a junior from the East Bay area here um, in California studying marketing with a minor in retail studies. He is an he is active in a few organizations both on and off our campus here at Santa Clara. So Malkai is part of the Levy Scholars Program. So this is a invitation only program here in the business school that's open to students who are in the top 10 to 15% of their class, which is generally a GPA of about a 3.8 and above. Um, so very difficult to do. Um, Malachi is also part of the ACE Leadership Program, as well as the Levy Black Business Association. And because he doesn't have enough on his plate, Malachi is also involved in MLT, a National Career Prep Program for BIPOC students. So I'm really happy and excited to have um, a Malachi with us today. Um, and if that was not enough, I um, have a second student that's joining me here today, and that's a student who um, was also in my class last quarter, Darius Johnson. So Darius is a junior studying finance and business analytics. Uh, he's originally from Chicago, Illinois, so getting used to all the sunshine and lack of snow here in the Bay Area. Um, similar to Malachi, Darius uh, likes to keep a very busy schedule. He is actively involved in a number of organizations on campus. Uh, he's the founder and chairman of the Santa Clara Investment Fund. He is a co-chair of the Sioka Center uh, Student Advisory Board. He's a part of Delta Sigma Pi. He's a peer career consultant, and he's also a part of the Black uh, Business Association here in the business school. Off campus, Darius is involved in a number of student-run ventures, um, including um, a student-run venture fund, uh, the dorm room fund. He also works um, in research at Coinbase. Outside of this, he's a big Chicago sports fan and enjoys spending time with his friends and family. So um, really two impressive students that we have here in the business school. So I um, really wanted them to join me here today. So the format of today is I'll give a brief 20 minute lecture on how you can become an exemplary leader today. And then we'll have 10 minutes at the end um, and I'll try my best to preserve those 10 minutes for question and answer. But as is traditionally the case in the business school, um, you can unmute and speak or put questions in the chat. So if you have a question, I would encourage you to just ask it live in real time, um, but you are free to save your questions until the end. So whatever works best for you. So um, I wanted us to get started with a little poll. Um, when you think about leadership, um, would you say that leaders are born or are leaders made? And we're just gonna use the chat function for this. So um, if you think leaders are born, then just put in a one in the chat. If you think leaders are made, then just put a two in the chat. Joy, I'm gonna force you into one response. So um, Joy, one or two, tell us. All right, and seeing lots of twos. Um, Gabriella says one. Um, okay, wonderful. Um, Gabriella, are you in a place where you can unmute and speak or not really? Maybe not. I tried to say two. I'm sorry. It was not oh, one. Oh, you tried to say two. Okay. So are we unanimous here on the twos that leaders are, are made? Should we just cancel the rest of this preview class and, and do something else? Um, okay. I want to hear from someone who said that leaders are made. It seems like we're pretty unanimous on this. Um, Kenneth, are you in a place where you can unmute and speak and tell us a little bit about what you're thinking in terms of leaders being made? Uh, hi, yeah, so uh, and Kenneth, can you hear me? where are you joining us from? 
uh, actually in San Jose. So I'm pretty oh. close to Santa Clara University. Excellent. Um, so personally, I grew up doing Boy Scouts. And I feel like as a kid, I was not really uh, the talkative type. And I wouldn't be very active in you know, trying to talk to people and helping and lead people. So I feel like as I grew up, you know, in an environment that was made to uh, create leaders and help with leadership, I feel like anybody in the right environment and the right circumstances with the right people have the opportunity of becoming a leader. Cool. Excellent. And Kenneth, it sounds like Boy Scouts has been one of those contexts for you where you've been able to develop your leadership skills, which is really great. I was, I was a Girl Scout growing up as well. So um, I'm surprised we didn't get a single one, um, but okay. So it sounds like our entire class is on board with the idea that leaders are indeed made. And that's consistent with some of the research on leadership. So um, Professor Posner, who's actually the chair of our management department, has done a lot of research on leadership. And the data suggests that 0.00013% of people do not have the capability or capacity to be a leader. So to me, that's the good news because uh, most of us, all of us, 99.99987% of us have the ability to become and be leaders in our, in our lives. So um, I hope one thing that you take away from this class today is the notion that leadership skills are trainable. So it's not something that you're either born with or not. It is something that all of us have within us and something that we can all cultivate and strengthen through different practices. So as I mentioned, uh, Professor Barry Posner on the right here, um, Jim Kuzis um, also taught here in the Levy School of Business, are two of the world experts on leadership. So they've written a number of books. One of the popular books that I use in my class is called the Student Leadership Challenge. And this really takes a transformational leadership perspective when thinking about uh, how can we become leaders. Um, and so one thing that can be helpful in thinking about leadership is thinking about our leader role models. Who are the people in our lives or that we see around us that we really admire? as leaders. So I'm curious, um, would anyone be willing to unmute and speak and share some people that come to your mind when you think about leaders that you admire in your life? And the, there is no wrong answer. So these are my favorite questions to ask because anything that you have to say is indeed the right answer. So who are some leaders you admire? William, William, where are you joining us from? Um, I'm from Seattle. Seattle, wonderful. I spent four years in Seattle at the University of Washington. So William, tell us, who are some leaders you admire? I think for me growing up, someone that I've always admired is my high school basketball coach. Um, and just his leadership style is very much like a servant leadership style in terms of like he does drills with us. Like that's his form of coaching. And then he also pushes us to be better leaders too. Great. So William, your high school basketball coach is not just sort of standing on the sidelines, sort of directing you to do sprints or layups or drills. Your coach is actually sort of in the trenches with you and doing these practices and exercises with you. And so you use the word servant leadership, that this is someone that you really admire because he's sort of in the trenches with the rest of the team. Is that right? Yeah, like in the weight room, he's doing all the workouts with us. Wow. So, William, I played a lot of sports growing up. I grew up in Lawrence, Kansas, home of the national championship Jayhawks. And uh, as you might guess, growing up in Lawrence, Kansas, you play basketball from, you know, when you're three years old onward. And I don't think I can think of a single coach, William, that did drills and did sprints uh, and went through all of that with us. So I really think that's a great example of your coach um, and, and a wonderful reason to admire that person. Thanks for sharing, William. Uh, anyone else want to share someone that comes to mind for a leader that you admire uh, in your life? Luke, Matthew, Derek? Anyone? Treya? Again, there's no wrong answer.
Malachi Finn, who are some leaders you admire? Absolutely. So a leader that I admire is Issa Rae, and she is a creator of the show Insecure. And the reason why I admire her is because throughout her show, she always helped out people that were in the neighborhood. So she filmed the show in Inglewood, and she would uh, go to the neighborhoods and help people out, either hire them as a truck driver or work in the custodial department, really providing opportunities for those around her so that she can uplift the community as she rose to the top as well. So that's someone that I admire that helps the people around them. Awesome. Another great example of someone who is using their position to lift others up and to make the world a better place. So according to uh, professors Kuzis and Posner, when they ask people and they usually give them these 10 different categories of your leader role models. So family members, a teacher, a coach. So as uh, William mentioned, his high school basketball coach, an immediate supervisor, um, sometimes a business leader, like sometimes people will say someone like um, Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook or Meta now, um, a coworker or a colleague, a religious leader, a political leader, a community leader, an athlete, actor, or entertainer. And then sometimes people have this sort of, I'm not sure, category. So um, if you're playing along at home, uh, people over the age of 25, so, uh, just me in this room, I think, um, would oftentimes say that their family members are actually uh, the majority of their sort of leader role models. So 62% of people in general will say, my family, is there someone in my family, whether it's a sibling or a parent or an aunt or uncle or a grandparent uh, or a cousin that is really a role model for me. And when we ask people, you know, under the age of 25, um, the family member domain is still quite large, about 47%, but oftentimes people will say um, things like my immediate supervisor, um, 14%. What I hope that you will take away from this brief 20 minute class um, is the following. And that's that leadership is not about formal titles, positions, or where someone lands in an org chart. It's truly about one life influencing another. And if I could be so bold as to modify this quote slightly, I would say it's really about one life influencing another in a positive way, right? That we are willing to have an impact on other people around us. So if you look to your left, if you look to your right, if you look around you right now in this moment, there might be people whom you could think about influencing their lives in a positive way today. And so professors um, Kuzis and Posner say that leadership role models are local. You may very well be the leadership role model for those closest to you. So oftentimes, right, when we see this list of these leader role models, we forget to consider that we are actually a role model for other people, right? So we are family members to others. Um, we can be teachers and coaches to others. Um, at some point, you may be an immediate supervisor to someone, right? And so leadership role models can be very, very local. And so we heard from William about um, sort of, uh, his basketball coach, right? You could think about for those of you that might be involved in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or other extracurriculars, that there are ways where you can be a leader today. And so one of the sort of frameworks that we use here in the Levy School of Business around leadership um, comes from this book, um, The Leadership Challenge. And The Leadership Challenge is really organized around these five practices of exemplary leadership. And so I'm going to quickly, relatively quickly, go through these five practices and then I want us to spend some time thinking about now that you've heard about these five practices, what are some things that you could do today? Um, maybe if you're in Pacific time zone, it's the day is still young, or maybe tomorrow or later this week to implement some of these practices of exemplary leadership. And as I go through these practices, as I mentioned, if you have a question, if you need an example, if something doesn't make sense, feel free to just unmute and, and, and speak. Um, Okay, so the first practice of exemplary leaders is one of my favorites, and that's called modeling the way. And so this first practice 
uh, actually each practice gets broken up into two commitments. So there's five practices and 10 commitments. So um, this first practice of modeling the way is broken up into clarifying your values is the first commitment. And the second commitment is setting the example. So what do we mean by clarifying your values? If I were to say, Sophie, um, what are the things that are important to you and why would Sophie be able to answer that? If I say, Colin, what are the things that are important to you? What do you value and why is it important to you? Would you be able to answer that question? Sometimes people are a bit taken aback by that. And so when we look at exemplary leaders, they're people who you can sort of stop them in the hall, you can stop them at the farmer's market, you can ask them right before they're about to go to sleep, what are the things that you value and why? And they're able to tell you off the top of their head because they know it so clearly. And so one of the things that we do is we do a little bit of a what I call a values audit, which I'll give my students a list of 80 different values and I'll have them sort of rank order the values that are not at all important to them, somewhat important to them, and very important to them. And getting some clarity around the why. So if you say that compassion, for example, is a value that's important to you, being able to articulate the why, why is that important to you? So again, if you think about being a leader today, maybe it's about getting clarity around the things that you value and why. Related to this is commitment to around setting the example. So it's not enough just to know what we value. We So that's our espouse values. We have to be able to enact our values. So in our day-to-day -day lives, how are we enacting our values? So in the things that we choose to do and in the things that we choose not to do. So for example, if I say that family is a value that's important to me, Am I actually sort of setting the example? Am I actually enacting my value of prioritizing my family in my life? So that's the very first practice. Uh, any questions about uh, this practice, clarifying your values or setting the example before I go to the second practice? Easier said than done, I know. Okay, so the second practice is called inspire a shared vision. And again, this practice is broken up into two commitments. And this is envisioning the future and enlisting others. So when we think about exemplary leaders, they're really thinking about changing the status quo. How can we envision a future that is better than what we have today? And so Envisioning the future means sort of really breathing life into your ideas and what you think is possible. So if you can dream it, it's possible. So once you you have this idea and you have this vision for the future and how things can be better than the status quo, you need to be able to enlist others into your vision. So um, as they oftentimes say, we go far together, right? And so if I want to uh, change the status quo in a way that is positive, that I might need to get Amanda on board, I might need to get Darius on board, I might need to get Malachi on board and get them excited and making sure that they know why this vision is important. How does it connect to my values? How does it connect to their values or shared values? So that's the second practice of um, inspiring a shared vision. So the third practice is called challenge the process. In this practice, people are actively searching for opportunities to make the world a better place. And this does not have to be anything big or grandiose. So you could think about um, the way that your family goes about uh, making dinner or the way that your family goes about meal prep. And maybe you think there's a better, more efficient way to do it. And so you could challenge the process, search for an opportunity to sort of streamline the process. And then, right, after you've come up with this idea or you see this opportunity, you want to then implement it. So the reason why this is called experiment and take risks is, is because we oftentimes don't know how it's going to unfold. We don't know what's going to happen. We have a hypothesis. We have a general idea of what we think might happen, but that may or may not be the case. And so that's why it's a little bit risky. But when we think about exemplary leaders, they are people who are willing to take risks. They're not shying away from making mistakes because they know that mistakes is really the only way that we can uh, change the world for better. 
Um, I'm looking at my time, so I'm going to try and speed up. If you have questions, unmute and ask. Um, the fourth practice here is called enabling others to act. And this is a practice where you are fostering collaboration between people. So maybe you have this vision, you want to implement it, but then you need to get people to collaborate with each other. You need to get people to work with each other. Um, you also want to be able to strengthen others around you. So oftentimes, maybe you wake up every morning thinking, you know, how can I be the best version of myself today? And when we think about exemplary leaders, they're moving away from the world revolving around them to sort of thinking about how can I make the people next to me better leaders? How can I make them better today than they were yesterday? So it's really about strengthening others. So oftentimes we're sort of laser focused on our own lives, but exemplary leaders are saying, it's not only about me, it's also about the people around me because I will become a stronger leader if I can help Amanda and if I can help Malachi and Darius and Shreya and Sophie and Jason and others. Um, finally, the fifth practice is called encourage the heart. Um, and again, the uh, ninth and 10th commitments here are called recognizing contributions and then celebrate the values and victory. So the idea here is that, you know, our lives and everything that we do is made possible and facilitated by a countless list of people who have supported us. And so we want to be able to recognize the contributions of people around us. And this is not just a generic thank you. This is actually being very specific, being very timely with our thank you, being very sincere and authentic, and recognizing how people have made it possible for us to do all the things that we want to do. So for those of you in this room who have um, applied to colleges and gained acceptances, um, you have, I imagine, a number of people that you could recognize who have helped you along your journey. And so exemplary leaders are really humble in that way and are expressing gratitude to the people around them. And then finally, celebrating the values and victories. So exemplary leaders are people who are willing to sort of celebrate uh, accomplishments, uh, however small or large, along the way, their own and accomplishments of others. And so, so often we think, oh, we'll celebrate once we graduate, or we'll celebrate once we get that job, or we'll celebrate once we win our national championship, if you're the Kansas Jayhawks. But instead, you can think about how can we celebrate um, small victories along the way. So you can think about it, these celebrations as adding sort of fuel or electricity to your vehicle that will help you get from point A to point B. So not just celebrating once you arrive at point B, but actually celebrating small victories along the way. So I'm noticing the time. We have six minutes together. I have another hour of things that I want to tell you about. Um, but I'll just leave you um, with this quote, uh, Vince Lombardi quote, um, that leaders aren't born, they're made, and they're made just like anything else through hard work. And so I hope that I've given you some ideas about the ways that you can develop yourself as a leader, because leadership skills are indeed trainable. Um, and ultimately, you know, what we ask is that you are choosing courage over comfort because it requires a lot of courage to be willing to step into the role of being a leader in your community, whether that's in your high school, whether that's in your family, in your neighborhood, on your basketball team, um, on your Boy Scouts or whatever the group is that you're a part of. So um, I know that we only have five minutes. I wanted to give you an opportunity to make comments, ask questions. Um, we have three wonderful students with us, um, uh, including Amanda, um, and they're happy to answer any questions or anything that's on your mind. So um, please feel free to unmute, ask your question, make a comment. Um, this time is really for you and, and your family. So. Colin, welcome. Where are you joining us from, Colin? Hi, can you uh, hear me all right? Yes, sir. I'm from San Jose as well. Wonderful. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, so my question is like in terms of classes, like how often are say um, like group activities or like group discussions, um, I guess just overall implemented and like what are different ways in which those could be tested uh, throughout class? Great, thank you, Colin. Um, Malachi and Darius, uh, would one of you be willing to answer Colin's question? For sure, yeah, I can go ahead and answer that. Thank you, Colin, for the question. So uh, in the setting, we oftentimes, especially in the Levy School of Business, majority of our projects are group-based. So you're gonna be working with different people that have majors in accounting, finance, marketing, whatever it may be, and you're gonna be able to hear a lot of different perspectives throughout these courses. And without the beyond the projects themselves inside of the classrooms during the lectures, we'll have different conversations with your peers about what do you think about this marketing campaign or how do you feel that leadership is important in these specific industries. So you'll definitely have that opportunity to speak with a lot of different people and kind of shift your way of thinking if that's something that you're interested in. Thank you, Malachi. Darius, we have a question in the chat from Sophie. Sophie's asking. How are most of your classes structured, lecture versus discussion based? So I know how my classes are structured, but um, Darius, why don't you take this question? Of course, Sophie. So that's a great question. Um, something I also wondered when I was coming in. Um, I think it really depends on the class, but when you're looking at the Levy School of Business, as Malachi just mentioned, a lot of the things we do are group based. So in my experience, a lot of classes that I've taken are very discussion based. So what that means is whether you know you come in the class and uh, maybe you've read before and what you get in the class you kind of break off in groups and you guys kind of talk about what what you've read and then come back and chat with the class or whether as you saw today where um, you know you maybe ask a um, question and you know folks kind of give their their thoughts on that question. Um, so I think it's like leaves the the business school tries to have that collaboration with students and not just, you know, coming in and being lectured, which is great sometimes, but I think in my experience, it's mostly kind of back and forth with students and the professor. Thank you so much, Darius. Thanks for those great questions, Colin and Sophie. Um, we have another question. What is the most challenging thing you've encountered in these classes? So Malachi, Darius, Amanda, um, anyone want to chime in on this question? The most challenging thing you've encountered in your classes? It's a great question. Um, I'll probably say like one of the challenging things um, uh, about these classes is um, the transition when you first get there. So transitioning to have new information. So for example, if you are a marketing major and you're taking a accounting course, I think the biggest um, thing that's a challenge is when you're going into that class, there's a lot of things that you don't already know. But the exciting part about that, right, is like, in the business school, they try and teach you kind of each discipline and at least get you kind of one in class in, in that discipline. So even though it is challenging, it is new, you kind of get to be like a well-rounded student, have like that well-rounded holistic education. So um, I think that's probably the most challenging thing is when you're in classes that maybe don't directly correlate to your major and you have to learn a new skill. But at the same time, I think it could be helpful as you can you know build those new skills. Thank you, Darius. And Darius, I know you need to jump off here. Um, so I'll send this next question to um, Malachi, if, if that's okay. Malachi, um, the question is, do you find it hard to balance all of your classes while on the quarter system? Right, that's a great question. I would say that uh, I personally don't find it that difficult to balance all of your classes. I think really you have to work on in college, whatever, even whether in your business school or you're in the medical field, is just time management. So how are you regulating your schedules? Like how are you fitting time in to eat lunch and also take care of yourself personally? Like one of the things that we learned in Professor Desiree's class is uh, really taking that time to, I think it was like our three minutes of self-regulation that we did every day. So like, how are you understanding what you're gonna have to work on and then just making sure that you're timing it in an efficient manner. So I would say taking those times to really book out your calendar, put it on Google Calendar, put it on a syllabus or um, a notebook that you have, just being structured and organized. I would say that's my best advice I can give to you to ensure that you're on top of everything. Um, because at the end of the day, it's really your responsibility to make sure you're knocking out those things. So as long as you have that self-regulation and just making sure you're on top of it, you should be fine. Thank you, Malachi. So I know we're at time. I wanna just answer this question as well, because, you know, back in the day when I was a student, um, I actually was a student here at Santa Clara. I did my master's degree here at Santa Clara. 
Um, I did find that the quarter system to be quite challenging because I did my undergrad at the University of Washington. We were on semesters there at the time. And um, I did find it very, very challenging to stay up to speed because things go so quickly in, in 10 weeks with you know midterms and finals and holidays and things like that. But one of the things that I love about Santa Clara is that because it's a small institution and because at least from my experience, the professors really care. Your professors are really there to make sure that you're going to succeed and that you're not going to fall behind. And so um, we really try to be um, thoughtful and mindful of what we're assigning and how much we're assigning and when we're assigning it so that because you only have 10 weeks, there's only so much that we can fit into 10 weeks. So as Malachi mentioned, it, you do need to be sort of structured and organized and Google Calendar should be your best friend, those sorts of things. But your professors are also sort of aware that it's only 10 weeks and um, that we it's not the same sort of amount of work or the same structure as it would be if we had an entire semester together. So um, it is, I think, a bit of a transition. So sometimes we have transfer students who are coming from a semester system coming to the quarter system. And it takes a little bit of, 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 of a transition. But like I said, we have such um, amazing faculty here and small classes that you're not in it alone. Um, there's a lot of resources on campus to sort of make sure that people are not falling behind. Um, so that's a great question. I know that we're at time. Um, Amanda, do we need to end the session? Um, I think if you have any other questions, then you can always just stay for a couple minutes and ask. Um, but if you have other things going on at this time, then feel free to hop off. Um, I can also drop my email as well if you have any questions about just the business school in general or um, admissions. Stuff yes, like that. thanks so much for attending. If you have other questions, um, you can feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, we're more than happy to answer those questions. Um, I'm happy to stay on um, for longer if there are questions, if anyone wants to, to ask, feel free to put it in the chat or unmute and speak, so. Michael, Joyce, uh, others, are there any questions that uh, any of us could answer? Anything that's on your mind? Oh, sorry. I think I'm, um, I just joined. Uh, I'm, I'm actually one of the parents. Yeah. Oh, hi, I'm, Michael. I'm, Welcome. I'm okay. <laughs> okay, great. Thank well, thanks, thanks for coming in. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay, uh, Ellie, uh, Ak Akisha, sorry, I can't say your name. Any other questions? Anything that's on your mind that we can answer? Okay, um, well, I'll put my email in the chat as well. That way, if there's anything that um, I can answer, feel free to reach out. Um, but if there's nothing else, Thank you so much, Malachi, uh, Darius, who's no longer here, and Amanda for facilitating this, this session today. There's no problem. Happy to help. Thank you. Take care. Have a good right. day.